I was so fortunate to be born into a really loving family who held both love at the center of their lives and the belief that we needed to make this a better society. So in addition to just being a good person that they also believed in, my folks, they believed that we should actually take it into our hands to make this a better world, to treat all people with dignity and respect and make sure the society was one which treated people with dignity and respect. So with those values, um, I grew up first in Brooklyn, in Bensonhurst, in a community that I was very comfortable with. And then we moved when I was a teenager, in fifth grade, to the North Shore of Long Island. And I didn't quite feel that I fit in where we moved. And so I ended up seeking out connections and other friends from some other places who did share those same values. Some I met at camp, still friends with. In fact, one, Ann Popkin, I met when uh, we had been friends when we were teenagers, lost touch with each other a little bit, and then in 1964 met when we were both going down to Mississippi for Freedom Summer. Um, and I also made my way into New York City uh, as I grew a little older to find people with shared values and connected first with American Friends Service Committee and then with CORE, the Congress on Racial Equality. And in my high school, I was involved in a wide array of activities from the yearbook and chorus and there was even a little sorority. And I realized that each of them were excluding people who uh, didn't fit a standard norm. African-American students, kids who seemed to be too fat, too thin, too pimply, too this, too that. And I left those organizations that wouldn't let others in and then made those people who were other my friends. We're the ones who sat down together at lunch. And I realized I had an association both with the other uh, and believed that we treat all people with dignity and respect both in our personal lives but also in our activities and what we do. About what year was this, or what years were these? I graduated from high school in 1963, so those were the general years. And I, I often say I was ready for the 60s before I knew <laughs> the 60s were coming. <laughs> and uh, were there any moments, like did you see the Freedom Rides take place and see the violence? Did that? whether it was the violence in Birmingham, the violence on the Freedom Rides, the violence that became so much of a part of how people literally began to view the movement in the early 60s. Did that accelerate or enhance the kind of engagement that you found yourself getting into? Mm -hmm. When I was a teenager, my first grade teacher found me. I had been living in Brooklyn, we moved to Long Island, and so she had to locate me, came to visit our family, and told a story that happened when I was in first grade. There was only one African-American kid in our class in first grade, and a boy named uh, Benjamin, and one of the girls said that he had stolen her lunch money, and there was a circle taunting him and the teacher said, I walked into the circle and put my arm around Benjamin. And the girl later found that the lunch money was in her shoe. So it's hard to say when all this started. I think that it was a part of me and a part of how I believed people should be. Um, I remember seeing the picture of Emmett Till, the battered, beaten, bloated body who had been so brutally murdered a teenager from 
Detroit who came to Mississippi and was lynched when he so-called whistled at a white woman. And we know now, years later, the woman says he never even did whistle at her, even if that would have been a problem and shouldn't have been a problem. And I was horrified that this is what could happen in our country. We needed to do something about it. When I heard about the sit-ins at Woolworths, I sought out CORE, Congress on Racial Equality, and there was a group in Manhattan that was regularly demonstrating at the CORE, uh, with CORE pickets in front of Woolworths, which wouldn't seat African Americans at their lunch counters in the South. And so that was a, an entry point, and I was welcomed into the movement. I was a, I was a young teenager and felt this is a community of people with shared values who are building a loving community. And taken in their embrace, I wanted to continue with this kind of work. Were you unusual in the sense that you were a high school student, 15, 16, 17 years old, and yet you find yourself moving towards the civil rights movement? Did, did you stand out? in that sense in your high school class? Were there others that followed you or did you follow anybody else or were you unusual in the sense that you just decided this was something that you needed to do? I looked for people who shared the same values. Um, but as I was saying, I was there was a little sorority called 16 and it had just 16 people were allowed in it. And I had suggested that some other kids be allowed in it including some of the black kids, and they weren't allowed in, and so I quit. I know I was on a cheerleading team, the Portettes, <laughs> we were in Port Washington, and I uh, realized that the African-American cheerleaders were much better than I was, but they weren't allowed on the team, and so I quit that. So I realized that each time I tried to pursue what I thought was living my values, I ran into um, barriers that didn't support it within that specific community, though my family supported it. And so I sought support elsewhere. Uh, at one point, Dr. King was speaking in a nearby town to where I lived, and I couldn't find anyone who'd go with me. And in those days, finding how do you even get transportation to go hear him speak uh, was a challenge. But I did hear him speak and was glad for it. But it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a big basis of support for it. I had a few very close friends, uh, some who shared the broad values. But at that point, uh, it was more about discussion about these ideas and less of the taking action. It's hard for me to remember how I was consciously thinking about it. Um, I did think that the explicit brutality that I was hearing about in the South, uh, say Emmett Till being lynched, others being lynched. I saw pictures of a man was lynched today from a different era. And I did think that the problem was more dramatic, the dividing line clearer in the South. I was actually born in Mississippi. My father was in the Army and I was born in Brookhaven, Mississippi when he was on an Army base in World War II. And uh, we left Mississippi, and part of my history is I knew we left Mississippi as soon as he no longer was deployed there because my folks didn't want to grow up in that kind of um, closed environment, both by race, by religion, we're Jewish, and uh, felt there was hostility against Jews also. So though I thought it was more extreme in the South, I certainly saw inequality, discrimination, injustice that I'd see in the North. I don't know that I had words to put to it or saw it as systemic. Uh, as I understand it now. So if I'm correct, you 
you go to the University of Chicago and that becomes your next stop. How did you choose the University of Chicago and how did you continue your activism once you arrived there? Um, I had interviewed at a number of colleges on the East Coast and I had had this prior experience with a sorority. So I didn't want to go to a school with a sorority. I didn't want to go to a school where I felt people were in just a closed environment. So a school uh, that might have been away from a city uh, that didn't have an urban experience. And the University of Chicago didn't have sororities. <laughs> There's a story that um, one of the students, Ida Noyes, had um, pledged to a sorority, had wanted to be in a sorority and then wasn't accepted and committed suicide. At least the rumor is, I don't know, apocryphal or not, that as a result her parents created the student center called Ida Noyes um, in her honor. And I was very impressed with that. I also, I didn't go to the campus. I was interviewed at a distance because I lived in New York. And we had a great discussion about books and philosophy and about how the world should look and what morality was like. And I thought, oh, this is the place that I want to go. And at that point, the university was focused on the life of the mind. Mm -hmm. And I found it very engaging and exciting. And I came to understand, though, you need the life of the mind in a society and the two need to be engaged. Once I got to Chicago, after the first week of being totally intimidated and wondering, did I really even belong? I was a pretty insecure person. And in some ways, I think I still carry that insecurity in the same way that many people feel, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not, I'm not enough. And so much of the society tells us we're not good enough. And part of what I've found is, however we are, together, we are stronger. Together, we can solve these problems. But we have to come together. We have to organize. So I came to the university out of an experience of feeling I didn't really belong. And within about a week, I felt <laughs> this, this was my place. Uh, there was a school boycott called against the public schools that had segregated and second-class schools for black kids. And it was at a time when you could have a black school and a white school next to each other. The black school was overcrowded and could have sent students into the white school and still had neighborhood schools without busing. There, wasn't, uh, there was still a closeness. But instead of doing that, the superintendent of schools put trailer, trailers on the school grounds of the black schools, and they were named after him. His name was Ben Willis, and they were called Willis Wagons. And so it became a symbol um, of what we were fighting against, which had substandard texts at the school, substandard lab chemistry labs. Uh, if there was a swimming pool in the white school, there was none in the black school. And so the school boycott was for quality integrated schools. And during the school boycott, there was an attempt to have freedom schools. And I played a role in recruiting teachers and helping to organize um, under the direction of a coordinating group, the Triple CO, the Coordinating Council of Community Organizations, and particularly with the leadership of SNCC or Friends of SNCC, which is what SNCC was called in the North. I became very active with it, helped recruit and build the, the, those freedom schools for that day that were just so great. The kids loved it, the parents loved it, the teachers loved it, <laughs> and uh, some progress was made because we had organized. I then learned a whole new world that was um, organizing on these issues. Al Raby was the head of the Coordinating Council of Community Organizations. He became a very good friend. Uh, and later on, his wife, who became uh, 
one of my best friends, and is still one of my best friends, Pat Novick Raby. Um, we ended up living together, Al and Pat, and my husband, Paul, and I ended up living in the same apartment together, both because it was cheaper to all live together, um, a little bit for security, and also we, we used to joke there was one police car out front who was keeping track of Al, Paul, my husband, who had been very active with a national student leader in the anti-war movement, the student movement, me and Pat. And we used to joke that the police car got four for the price of one. <laughs> uh, but I, I came into a whole new world. So there was Al, um, the head of uh, SNCC, uh, Sylvia Fisher and Monroe Sharp were the co-chairs of SNCC in Chicago, a white woman and a black man. Um, and uh, Fanny Rushing was the staff person and who's still keeping alive the SNCC tradition in Chicago. And I set up a Friends of SNCC chapter on my campus and became the coordinator of that and carried on the activities uh, from that uh, Friends of SNCC chapter, as well as other things on campus. I was involved in the student government. I was involved in SDS. I had set up what became the first independent women's liberation organization on a campus. Uh, and just, I love this world. It opened up for me and I fully engaged it. So 63 to 64, my first year, I was very active in a lot of things, but the civil rights movement through Friends of SNCC, uh, the anti-war movement against the war in Vietnam, um, and the building of a new left on campus. The women's movement activity really started in 1965, and there's a whole story to it that also is related a bit to SNCC. At a, at a crucial point, one of the SNCC organizers uh, played a crucial role. I'd like to back up a little bit and talk about Friends of SNCC. Uh, Friends of SNCC is something that people know of, but very few people, other than specialists and people who took part in it, know actually what it did. What did it mean to be a friend of SNCC on a northern college campus? What, what kinds of things did you all do? The SNCC was the overall organization. It was largely uh, staffed by field staff who were full-time, <laughs> low-paid, deeply dedicated front lines of the civil rights movement. $9.64 a week after taxes. <laughs> uh, and were incredible organizers who went in and listened to people, who heard more than they talked, who um, then gave people a way to come together and take action together and gain confidence and gain victories. In the North, to distinguish from those who were the full-time field staff, we had Friends of SNCC chapters, and those were designed largely to support the work going on in the South, but we also emerged into support for work on civil rights going on in Chicago. So we did fundraising. Uh, we had a uh, big event with Dick Gregory where we raised money to give to Amzie Moore who really helped to initiate the voter projects in Mississippi. Um, we did demonstrations to create visibility for the issue. Uh, we would write up educational material. We, had, we were on campuses, so we often injected those issues into the coursework and had sympathetic professors use that as part of the coursework, but would raise it so that it was the life of the mind within a society. Um, and then we became knowledgeable ourselves on the issues and were able to talk about it. For several years, I was also doing national traveling, going to other campuses uh, and other places talking about our experience. This is particularly after 1964 when I went south to Mississippi. And Friends of SNCC also helped to recruit for the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project that happened in 64. Were you a recruiter? Or 
No, I was a volunteer. I actually was recruited mm -hmm. and I applied, but we also recruited other people, but as volunteers. I see. Uh, so what was it like for you as New York raised, you're at the University of Chicago, then you find yourself in rural Mississippi in the summer of 1964. What was that like? Can you talk a little bit about everything from just being there, what you saw and what you did, to some of the cultural dynamics that existed for a lot of northern students coming south for the right. first time? Well, first of all, there was a rigorous acceptance project uh, process. I'm not, I think I was borderline whether I'd even be accepted. You have to write essays, why do you want to do it? There were interviews. Uh, uh, Curtis Hayes, now Curtis Muhammad, was one of the people who interviewed me. Um, and he was, you know, really wanting to know would I be able to stand the rigors of the South and would I respect the people that I was living and working with and knowing that this was their struggle and they were taking the lead in their struggle. We then had a training session in Oxford, Ohio, and I was in the second round of training there were two rounds going down. And it's particularly notable because um, while in the training we learned about nonviolence, we learned about poverty, we read Michael Harrington's The Other America, just about poverty in America. We had great speakers come about uh, the state of race relations in America, the legal status, the political analysis, that part of the reason we were going down was that there were these rotten boroughs. There were uh, places where African Americans were way overrepresented in the population for what they represented in the voting population, almost none, uh, because people lived in a state of terror. And poor black people lived in a state of terror. So we learned uh, technical skills, cultural background, political history. We learned relationships with each other. We learned what we do, what we would be teaching, we were teaching both uh, literacy uh, with a Laubach method for pe so people could learn a literacy test to write their names uh, and when they register to vote. We learned, uh, we saw a curriculum that Staunton Lind and others had developed of freedom school teaching that also was learning from people their own history so that the main lesson was people can make their history. We've made it in the past, we can make it in the future when we come together. Um, and we learned skills of nonviolent civil dis disobedience so that we'd be disciplined and not jeopardize the lives of the others we were working and living with. Just before the session ended, the people in the second group that was about to go down got the news from Bob Moses that three of the volunteers Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, who was from Mississippi, and Michael Schwerner were missing. They had been picked up by the local sheriff when they were investigating a church bombing and released at night. We knew it was dangerous. And while we hoped for the best, we thought it was likely that they had been killed. And Bob Moses, in framing a parallel of good and evil, around the Lord of the Rings and the impact of power and how power corrupts and how we are part of the force to address that power. And in a very moving time, he both tried to give people space if they chose not to go and wanted to know if we'd commit to go. I committed to going when I called my folks, who I love dearly, just before I went, they were hysterical on the phone because they were so frightened. My mother was so frightened she couldn't really talk. My father was so frightened that he, one of the first times I actually remember him yelling at me, it's not the kind of house I grew up in, but he was so frightened. But I went down the next day, so part of what was in my frame was both concern for the people I lived with, I didn't want to get any of them killed, 
concern for my parents who I loved dearly but felt our relationship had fractured over this. And going down, just trying to figure out what I could do that could be of any help. I was in three towns in Mississippi. The first was in Rollville, where we met with Ms. Hamer, who, in fact, I've got a picture of her right there if you want, right there. If you, you can pull it over. You see right in the corner? So, okay, sure that does. so oh, wow. here's Ms. Hamer, uh, just outside of her home with two of her friends. And I was often the person playing the guitar uh, for the group meetings, uh, even though I didn't have a very good voice. But I figured I had the spirit to carry it along. And from Ruralville, we went to Shaw, a little town. And um, I stayed with a most remarkable family, Andrew and Mary Lou Hawkins and their kids. The generosity of that family, the courage, the insights, the knowledge, the leadership that they provided uh, is breathtaking. I've never seen a greater demonstration in my entire life. And there were so many things I didn't even appreciate initially. I think we had four volunteers staying in the house. First of all, this family that had not many resources took in four volunteers. And we slept in what I only later understood was Mr. and Mrs. Hawkins' large bed. And they must have slept on the couch or on chairs in another room. But they took us in with incredible generosity. Um, one early night, I had a conversation with Mr. Hawkins. And I had prided myself on really knowing about Chicago politics. And I realized he knew so much more about Ch Chicago politics than I knew. He regularly got the Chicago Defender. He kept up on it. He asked me questions I certainly didn't know the answers to. And I realized you need to listen to local people, trust them, they know what they need, and then find out from them what they want us to do. They took us with them to church, um, a black revival church. Uh, Church of God in Christ. That was a whole new experience for me. <laughs> uh, we lived in a house that was, um, they had a pig and the pig would come in and out of the house. It was sort of the indoor and the outdoor was a little bit permeable. So um, we're pretty far from Long Island at this point. <laughs> far from Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they had an outhouse. They had running water in the house, but had an outhouse. Um, and their love really was transformative. After the summer, the Hawkins family joined in with some other families in Shaw and sued the town of Shaw for unequal facilities that were in the white part of town and in the black part of town. The black part of town had no paved roads, no sewer system, no indoor toilets. Um, the white part of town had all of that and more. The Hawkins family, and it's, the suit is called Hawkins v. Uh, Shaw. The Hawkins family and the few other families won the suit going all the way to the Supreme Court. And there's some who think that that case is as significant as Brown versus Board of Education. After the lawsuit, their house was firebombed twice. And in the second firebombing, one son and two grandchildren were killed. And they never found the people, I don't even know if they investigated thoroughly for the people who caused the firebombing. And then a bit later, one of the policemen 
shot Mrs. Hawkins to death. And though he was tried, he was exonerated. So you have four people in one family who were killed because they stood up for justice and freedom. And almost no one knows that story. And this summer, or this fall, I think in October, um, Benny Thompson, the congressman from that area, has gotten a piece of highway renamed in the name of the Hawkins family. And uh, Tilma Washington, who's working for him on this project, is trying now to raise funds so there can be an organizer to come back to Shaw to revitalize the movement for self-determination and the freedom and justice movement. So Shaw had a profound effect on me. The third town that I went to was Rollville. It was, um, sorry, the third town I went to was uh, Cleveland, which was more of a town. I mean, there was paved roads and there were, Amzie Moore, who lived in Cleveland, had actually uh, a brick and cement building. I mean, things were more, uh, bit more built up in that area, more of a, not quite a city, but mini city. Um, and I lived with a woman who was a midwife and who also uh, made moonshine. Uh, Mississippi was a dry state, at least those counties were dry. <laughs> and she made moonshine in the bathtub. <laughs> she could only take a bath on, I think it was Sunday, <laughs> the day that everything was <laughs> delivered out. Um, but again, incredible generosity. People are going on with their lives, taking risks because we're there, uh, and accepting us into their homes. And we did more voter registration there. In Shaw, while I was there, we did uh, freedom school work. So we did training of people, people's history, telling your own story, literacy, um, some reading and writing. And then we also went out to do voter registration work. And we gathered up a crew of as many people as we could and brought them down to the courthouse to register to vote. The police picked us up to stop the registration drive. And they held us until it was too late, just about nightfall, at which point the drive was ended. And we realized if you can't register using the official tools of registration, we would do a freedom registration. And the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party uh, became a very vital vehicle. Uh, Ms. Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, became co-chair of that. So you had a white reverend and a black former sharecropper who became co-chairs. And we'd go out to get people to register in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And then it was organized by town, by county, and by state, voting who they wanted to represent them at the National Democratic Convention in Atlantic City. And at the end of the summer, as the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party came to Atlantic City. Um, the Freedom Democratic Party was offered two seats as a compromise, which was an integrated delegation as opposed to the all-white delegation. And Ms. Hamer, with the moral clarity that she always had, said, we won't take two seats because we're all tired. And it didn't win that day but it did rivet the consciousness of a country. It did change the rules of the Democratic Party. So you now have integrated, racially integrated, and later gender integrated uh, delegations to the Democratic Party. And you can just see it at these conventions. <laughs> you look at the Republican Party and the Democratic Party for who's seated and who's not. And in one room, you have an integrated room, racially integrated room with multi uh, faceted uh, backgrounds, and in another you have basically a white population in which 
uh, there's a search for where is that African American? Where is? So change was made because people organized. And then after 1964, within a year, there was a Voting Rights Act. And so even when things seem most hopeless, even when lives are taken, even when people live in terror and you almost can't see a way out, there is a way when people organize, but we have to organize. It doesn't happen naturally. And I think the most important lesson for these students that are watching this is that if we organize, we can change the world, but we need to organize. Among the other great lessons I learned from Mississippi, and there were many, one was sometimes there's illegitimate authority and you have to stand up to illegitimate authority. You may even have to break a law if it's an unjust law. I learned how much we need to trust local people. People know what they need if given just a little bit of help and a chance to get together. And people's courage and generosity can really start to mirror the beloved community that Dr. King talked about. Well, one movement gives birth to another. Almost every modern movement owes our lives to the civil rights movement. And partly it was because of the incredible courage and uh, brilliance of the civil rights movement, but also it's because the civil rights movement in the 60s came out of a period of uh, McCarthyism and quiescence, uh, political quiescence, with a lot of work going on but not visible because McCarthyism drove out some of the most vital portions of the progressive movement with a scare that that person's a socialist, that person's a communist, that person's not to be trusted. Oh, you're against lynching? You must be a communist. Oh, uh, you want to raise issues about wages of, of uh, farm workers in the South? Oh, uh, maybe you're a communist. Oh, you once went to a meeting with someone who... so. This guilt by association uh, in which people were fired, some people were hounded so much they committed suicide, people went underground, had to have a new identity because you couldn't hold a job in your old name, uh, in your real name, uh, because of this period of McCarthyism and the Red Scare. So out of that period, the work on the ground with civil rights was still going on. And then in the civil rights movement, as it burst forth, it gave new courage to everything that came after. One of the movements that it helped to, to, uh, to birth was part of the women's movement. And there were many origins, particularly from uh, SNCC in the South. During the summer of 64, uh, Mary King, Mary Varela, and uh, was so it the third writer on that? Do you know who the third writer was? Not off the top of my head. Were, I actually have the paper I upstairs. Yeah. Um, wrote a paper about, uh, I think, ca cast and sex? Was that what it was called? Um, anyway, what, I may have the details wrong, but I know the point. So it was being circulated, and it raised the issue of women in the movement and raised the question of what's the position of women in the movement? And then um, the person who was, um, and the, the quip answer, the, the joking answer was, oh, women's position in the movement, it's prone on our back. Uh, it's sometimes attributed to the person who said it, but actually he was mocking uh, how the movement treated women and he himself, I think, really uh, did was inclusive of women, at least in the project that I was in, the projects where I saw. He was our overall supervisor, uh, Stokely Carmichael, uh, Kwame Ture later. Um, but that paper was one of the first times the issue was raised and being talked about. By 1965, I'm back on campus. I had been spreading the story of the Civil Rights Movement, and my professor, Dick Flax, who had been in the founding of SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, 
I was a sociology professor at the University of Chicago. He said that there was going to be a national conference of SDS in Champaign-Urbana and that they were going to discuss the woman question. And based on some things I had said in class, he thought that it would be interesting for me to go down. And so I went to my first SDS conference, though I had been a member of SDS on campus and quite active in it. During that conference, there was a many hours discussion about women, women's roles, and the women would say, I sometimes feel you don't listen to me, and the men would say, oh, that's not true. <laughs> or the women would start talking and the men would interrupt. And three of, uh, three SNCC organizers, led by Jimmy Garrett, who was a uh, terrific SNCC organizer, got up and said, the women aren't gonna get their act together until you go off by yourselves and talk by yourselves. And so he left with his two, two uh, men friends. And at first I thought, oh no, we are black and white together, we're men and women together, we can make this all work. And then after about another hour I realized he was exactly right. We just can't make progress unless those who feel the problem most directly can talk with each other. We went off as women. Uh, when we went back to our towns and I came from Chicago, I started women's liberation groups on campus and then in the town overall, in the, uh, my community overall, um, and set up the, the um, RAP, Women's Radical Action Program. And one of the reasons that we set it up is I had been speaking in a, an SDS gathering on campus and when I was talking, one of the guys said, ah, shut up. And I was so shocked that he'd treat anyone that way. And I also felt he shouldn't treat me that way. I tapped all the women on the shoulder when I was done speaking and said, let's go upstairs. We did. And we formed this group, Women's Radical Action Program. And the name came out of um, Students for Democratic Society had community organizing groups called ERAP groups. Um, and there was one in the north side of Chicago called JOIN, uh, Jobs or Income Now stood for, uh, that was working in a white Appalachian part of the city. Um, and that project did things like studied what we called significant response. How often did a teacher respond to a man student and a woman student? So the teacher might go, uh, John, what do you think? And John would say something and the teacher would say, oh, that was very interesting, and have you considered this or that? Uh, Bill, what do you think? And Bill would say, and say, oh, I don't think that that really works because what about this? Sue, what do you think? Robert, what do you think? As if Sue didn't even exist. And we call that significant response. And it was a four to one significant response for men versus women. Then we released the study, we had it discussed in classes, uh, we'd also prepare women. So women would feel insecure. If you're treated as a non-person, you feel like a non-person. So we'd prepare before going into the class. And if Sue raised her hand and said something and then was ignored, another woman would raise her hand and say, I thought what Sue said was very interesting. I think we should go back to that question and pursue it a little bit. And so we, we did a number of efforts like that. We had some demonstrations also. Um, also in 65, a friend of mine had been raped uh, at knife point in her bed. When we went with her to student health to get a gynecological exam, she was given a lecture on her promiscuity and told student health didn't cover gynecological exams. We sat with her, they called it a sit-in, and because people organize, you now get gynecological coverage from student health, not only at that university, but around the country. But we only make that progress when we organize. And we now know those rights are now being taken away. But we can make progress when we organize. Uh, further in 65, a friend of mine told me his sister was pregnant and was nearly suicidal and wanted an abortion. And I wasn't sure what to do. I hadn't really ever thought about the issue before and have never had to address it personally. But I went to the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which was the medical arm of the civil rights movement, and asked them if they knew anyone who would provide an abortion and was directed to TRM Howard, who was an extraordinary doctor 
and civil rights activist who had left Mississippi when his name appeared on a Klan death list, came to Chicago and set up uh, what I only learned later was Friendship Clinic on 63rd Street, a large women's clinic. And he and I made an arrangement by phone. He did the procedure and I thought I would just go on my way. I thought I was just doing a favor for a friend. But word must have spread from someone else, not from me, <laughs> and someone else called. And then word spread and someone else called. And I set up a system. We call the system Jane. And over time, the women of Jane ended up performing themselves 11,000 abortions between 1965 and 1973 when Roe was passed. It became the law of the land. It was ruled by the Supreme Court. And when we organize, we make a difference. And now these rights and freedoms for women are now being pushed back. And though seven in 10 people in the United States don't think Roe should be overturned, it's functionally being overturned now. And women's lives, our freedom, our choice about whether we can have full participation in the society is being threatened with this assault on women. And it's only with organizing that we'll really be able to respond and turn this around. And we need to organize. So one movement informs another. At the same time, there was an emerging anti-war movement. Um, I was very active on campus in that. We organized the first sit-in at a, an administration building against the war in Vietnam. And uh, that was against the university participating with a selective service system on a ranking system of male students. And we knew uh, the rank order, how high your grade point average was, would then be given to the selective service system. And if you had a lower grade point average, you were more likely to be drafted and sent to a war that we didn't believe in anyway. I mean, what was that purpose of that war? Um, and the sit-in against the rank then attracted national attention. And one of the speakers that was invited in was the National Secretary of Students for a Democratic Society, whose headquarters was based in Chicago. His name was Paul Booth. He says a friend told him to look for me. <laughs> we sat next to each other. Three days later, he asked me to marry him. Five days later, I said I would if we waited a year. And we were married in 1967 when I graduated and were married for 50 years until he died just a little over a year ago. And we were movement partners. And even in the last day of his life, he died unexpectedly. We knew he had been ill, but didn't think it was that serious. I had signed up for a civil disobedience uh, on behalf of Dreamers. It was called uh, Jews for Dreamers. It was going to be a faith-based support for Dreamers. There were probably 80 rabbis and other clergy there. Um, and tell us who the Dreamers were. Oh, the, uh, they're the uh, undocumented young people who are students and by uh, and we're looking for a way to be able to stay in this country and have at least a protected status and uh, have so many dramatic stories and of course Trump has undone uh, any protections or promise of any protections for dreamers. I wasn't going to go to the sit-in once I knew my husband was ill. He said, no, 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 you really should go. I went to the sit-in. It got a lot of attention. I come back to the hospital. Paul is in a great mood. He's feeling uh, terrific on seeing the, the pictures of the sit-in and seeing the visibility and showing it, in fact, to the nurses uh, some of whom themselves are immigrants. 
and sending the pictures around. And then uh, within an hour, he, he died very unexpectedly. And I mention it partly because the last joy in his life was his pleasure at seeing that, in effect, we were both taking action to support another generation in search of freedom and justice. And that's what we lived our life for. And I hope in part through this video and the kind of teaching you did, and certainly by the life that Julian Bond led, I hope others learn the lesson of how our lives can be enriched when we ourselves are part of the struggle for justice and freedom. I knew who Julian was, and like anyone, just about, who was for justice and freedom, fell in love with Julian from a distance. Um, I admired him, admired his work, had heard the story about him not being seated uh, in the Georgia legislature <laughs> and then winning. Um, I had followed him around the Democratic Convention and being offered into uh, nomination. So for, you were at the 1968 convention? For, we were at the, I was outside, okay. but I was in the streets with a brand new baby who was just weeks old, thinking that we were going to a picnic. And that was Grant Park, and then the tear gas started coming from the, from the uh, police riot. So I knew who Julian was and admired him. At the SNCC reunion in Mississippi, it wasn't the 50th, and I'm trying to remember which one it was, but at a prior SNCC reunion, Julian, his wife Pam, and I were seated together sometimes and in conversations in the year 2000. And after that, Julian approached me and asked me if I would run the advocacy arm of the NAACP, which had received a good deal of funding and was building up even greater funding to run a uh, very intensive African-American get out the vote effort and wanted it run both in a grassroots way and professionally. I had had a history of organizing on different issues. I had started a training center for organizers and had trained many, many organizations around the country and thousands of people. I had started, been co-director of a, um, a, one of the first organizations that built statewide organizations, multi-issue, which both were new phenomena, statewide and multi-issue. They used to be local and national groups and we combined them. Um, I had helped to play a role in uh, helping to build the working women's movement and other efforts. And then after Reagan was elected, I became involved in politics, was very active with Mayor Washington in Chicago, and then in other Chicago campaigns. And then by 93, I had just run the field campaign for Carol Mosley Braun when she ran and won for Senate in, uh, from Illinois. Uh, in 93, I went to work at the Democratic National Committee, first to help set up a field effort, and then I did outreach as a single payer advocate, but for the Hillary Healthcare Plan, and then became the training director, and had run a very large scale training operation. And this is all during the 1990s? This is 93, 94, 95 through 98. Okay. So it was just before I met Julian. And he asked me then if I would run this uh, get out the vote arm and they'd set up a new organization NAACP National Voter Fund. I tried to find someone else who could run it but it was late it was already July and or end of June beginning of July and uh, 
I couldn't find someone to run it. it also, it sounded like out of the blue. <laughs> and I agreed to run it and spoke to and had Julian support. They set up a five-person board. Um, and it was an extraordinary effort. And Julian's leadership was extraordinary. He was exactly the kind of chair you wanted. Someone who informed you, ensured you were accountable, and gave you the room to actually implement the program that could really work. And we created a massive effort. Uh, we were in about 30 states in, with grassroots effort. We had thousands of volunteers around the country. We had uh, 80 people who were stipended to us in coordination. We only had five people on the central staff. So it was a very small operation where really the effort worked out in the field, partnering with the NAACP, uh, which was the legal uh, C3 organization to the C4 organization that was moving out uh, on this larger get out the vote effort. And I'm told that there was, I mean, we increased African American turnout by over a million votes. We increased the turnout in Florida by such a high percentage that it's why George Bush decided he had to steal the election because the African American vote was so extraordinarily high that it hadn't been expected. And at every point, Julian was there to support this effort. We had a fairly controversial ad that we ran. Uh, Renee Mullins, who was, uh, whose father had been dragged to death in Texas. And we had an ad about that uh, because then when she, as a hate crime, when she goes to Governor George Bush and, of Texas and says, I'd like to get your support for a hate, cr hate crime legislation. George Bush says no. And we took out an ad with a slight re partial reenactment of the sound reenactment of what happened. Uh, and it was very dramatic. And it helped motivate the black community. Turnout increased. We know Bush stole the election and so we weren't successful. We didn't do enough on voter protection work, which we now still need to do. And the voter funds has still continued and is now the C4 or advocacy arm of the national NAACP under the great leadership uh, that Derek uh, Johnson is providing from Mississippi. And Julian saw this through. And then Julian and his wife, Pam, and I became very good friends. Uh, we had sell our birthdays were around the same time, and, the, and his date's the same as Taylor Branch's birthday, but mine is around the same time, so we'd sometimes go out together for birthdays uh, and other times. As, as a movement couple, it's uh, an exceptional life to be a movement couple with Paul and me and Pam and Julian. At every moment, Julian's clarity about what needed to be done, his moral direction. I'd call it courage, but he wouldn't. He would just say it was the right thing to do. And he treated something that even would have taken emotional energy from another person as just the most natural thing. And on every issue that mattered, he was there. At one point, I was working on uh, the Iran Agreement and Julian made a statement for the Iran Agreement, calling for a vote on this Iran Agreement, this great civil rights leader. At what, one point- What was the Iran Agreement? Oh, uh, that was an agreement in order to uh, the limit the nuclear uh, capacity of Iran. There was a, an agreement that was in operation until uh, the current president withdrew from it bringing us closer and closer and to a verge of war. But Julian took a stand for the agreement. I was working on uh, marriage equality. I ran the coalition around marriage equality around the Supreme Court decision. 
Julian agreed to come to our big rally, to stand up, to speak for it. Whatever the issue, he was there. I ran an effort on uh, Social Security. Julian was there. He would give a quote. He would give a tweet. He would give a... Um, he'd physically come if he possibly could. Uh, there was an immigration. Uh, we had a... Uh, again, I, I ended up running large... either running or advising large-scale social change efforts. I was the strategic advisor to the immigration reform campaign. We had a fast that went on for many days. And Julian joined us uh, not in the fast, but in, in support for it. And it was so meaningful. So you have the great leader, one of the great leaders of one movement, providing inspiration for another movement and teaching the lessons and seeing how they're carrying on because he always saw the connection between those movements, between those people. He knew the importance particularly of young people in the movement because he had been part of this student nonviolent coordinating committee. And at each point, he not only spoke truth to power, but he knew that we need to organize to have real power behind those words. He is one of the greatest leaders I've ever known. He's one of the greatest people I've ever known. He is irreplaceable and his legacy goes on and I'm so grateful that you're recording these recognitions of him, his impact and this work so that it is carried on. Jillian was also one of the greatest human beings I've ever known. Both a regular person and a superhero, both at the same time. Superhero to others, regular person to himself. He always had a, a mocking sense, uh, loved a good joke. Um, and took things deeply seriously. His impact on civil rights, on equality overall, and on marriage equality will leave a lasting legacy. He did this extraordinary effort which helped to lead the NAACP into support for marriage equality. And by his presence and his actions, helped to raise and elevate the need for racial equality within the LGBT movement. And so wherever he went, he was a Johnny Appleseed, or maybe we can just say, maybe we can aspire to be a Julian Bond supporting movements, supporting people, and out of both love and hate for the indignities that people face, find ways to bring us together and move us forward. I miss him dearly. The world misses him. We need more of him now, and we need all those watching this video to go out and take up that spirit.